All right, we're going to get started here. So just want to welcome everybody to the second installment of the ATS, COVID-19 Critical Care Training Forum. Uh, we ran our first session last week, uh, last Tuesday, 8 to 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, that recording is available uh, on the ATS site. It has some great information in it. We had Dr. Landsberg presenting on the assessment and treatment of hypoxemia in COVID cases. And then we also had a wonderful uh, presentation by Dr. Atul Mahodra on mechanical ventilation in COVID-19, which touched on some pretty high-end stuff, including uh, proning. Today, uh, I'm excited that we have uh, several work presentations to lead off. So I'm Laura Crotty Alexander. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine here at UCSD. Um, I uh, will be happy to introduce Dr. Alex Cypro, who will be talking first. Uh, he's going to give a quick uh, five-minute review of the sort of uh, best things that we learned, the hottest things that we learned last week. And this will be followed by uh, Dr. Abdur Hussein, who is a pulmonary critical care fellow. And he will be uh, briefly discussing some of the hottest questions and controversies in COVID management. Uh, Dr. Rolfson, uh, an internal medicine resident, will present a COVID case. And this will lead right into a ventilation 101 talk by uh, our pulmonary critical care fellow, Dr. Bellinghausen-Stewart. So we're going to do all of that in the first half hour, and then um, for the second half hour, we have with us today Dr. Christine Bojanowski from Tulane um, and Dr. Jeff Zilberstein from Southside Hospital. So as we know, New Orleans and New, New York City are some of the hardest hit areas uh, with COVID-19. And so we're lucky to have them on the line with us today. Um, we'll be looking for questions in the chat box as to things that you would like to know from them about the clinical presentations they've seen, the challenges they've faced, and the workflow um, changes that have had to happen in these hard hit areas to help them care for all of these patients. So again, uh, this forum will be happening weekly on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. for East Coasters. We have a wonderful crew of medical educators that organize this and are putting this on. Uh, many of them are on the chat. So do feel free to introduce yourself on the chat. Uh, you can also post questions on the chat. And if you don't want to uh, post those questions uh, to everybody, you can send them directly to uh, anybody on the right hand of this page for sure. Um, and they will make sure that we talk about your uh, questions. And we would love to hear a little bit about you and get feedback on the forums. So please uh, take this survey. We'll be posting that link in the chat box as well. And then if you're just looking for other ways to help out uh, COVID researchers, uh, this is another survey that we'll be sharing that is looking to assess the impact of COVID stress on sleep quality. So I don't know about you guys, but my sleep has definitely been impacted um, by this uh, COVID crisis. Um, so with all of that, thank you so much uh, for joining us. We're happy to have everybody here. And I'm going to switch over to Dr. Cypro's uh, talk. And he's going to tell us uh, a bit about um, what we covered last week that we wanted to make sure that everybody had a chance to um, see this week. And hold on one second. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Cipro. I'm a senior internal medicine resident at UCSD. And like Dr. Crotty Alexander mentioned, we'll start today's sessions with a quick look back at the discussion about oxygenation and ventilation that we had last week. So we started off um, with a review of oxygenation presented by Dr. Judd Landsberg. Um, I think we can ad advance the PowerPoint. Sorry, thank you. Uh, uh, of course, he's uh, Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care at the San Diego VA. Um, and he's also a master clinician who's published a practical manual filled with bedside skills and explanations of common pitfalls 
um, in the care of critically ill patients. You can get a sneak peek by friending the Landsberg Manual on Facebook. All right, next slide. Dr. Landsberg first tackled the difference between hypoxia and hypoxemia. Uh, hypoxia is primarily a failure of the circulatory system. It results in systemic lactic acidosis and is treated by increasing cardiac output and vascular tone. Hypoxemia, on the other hand, is a low partial pressure of arterial oxygen and represents a failure of the respiratory system. The key takeaway is that increasing PaO2 above 60 will not meaningfully increase oxygen delivery to tissues or decrease lactate. Dr. Landsberg also reminded us that dyspnea is not a major symptom of hypoxemia. Rather, mild hypoxemia causes stress on the brain, the heart, and the kidneys, as shown in the figure here, and causes mental status changes, stiffening of the left ventricle and tachycardia, and a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. Severe hypoxemia will result in lactic acidosis and eventual cardiac arrest from pulseless electrical activity. All right, next slide. Dr. Landsberg then discussed in detail why he targets a pulse oximetry saturation goal of greater than 94%, explaining that there's an inherent three-point error range associated with the use of pulse oximetry and that underlying alkalemia can steepen the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and increase the risk of rapid desaturation. All right, next slide. We were also reminded that we should not withhold 100% oxygen due to fear of CO2 retention. While in some patients, a high FiO2 will increase the partial pressure of CO2 a little, this is due to a steel fin phenomenon in diseased lung and changes in perfusion rather than a suppression of respiratory drive. All right, next slide. We then moved on to an update on evidence-based ventilation strategies in ARDS from Dr. Atul Malhotra. He's a former president of the American Thoracic Society, a research chief of the pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine programs at UCSD, and also one of the world's leading experts on ARDS. Next slide. Dr. Malhotra started by reminding us that the standard of care for patients with ARDS is to use low tidal volume strategy, meaning six cc's per kilogram or less, in order to protect lungs from mechanical injury by the ventilator. Additionally, we discussed, um, we had a discussion about the appropriate way to use driving pressures in the care of ARDS patients, and that driving pressure is the difference between plateau and positive and expiratory pressures. All right, next slide. Dr. Malhotra um, discussed recruitment maneuvers and how a homogeneous lung may help to reduce the shear forces which occur at junctions of normal and abnormal lung. We reviewed the evidence behind why prone positioning in severe ARDS helps our patients survive when combined with a low tidal volume ventilation. All right, next slide. The discussion also turned to a couple more controversial topics. Dr. Malhotra reviewed the evidence behind dispersion of exhaled particles with the application of nasal cannula, as well as guidelines released by the Surviving Sepsis Campaign with regards to the use of high-flow nasal cannula in patients with COVID. The conclusion that Dr. Malhotra shared with the group is that he is now comfortable using high-flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation in COVID patients provided that healthcare workers have adequate personal protective equipment. Finally, we touched on the role of steroids in ARDS and COVID, as well as the risks of using um, drugs off-label for the treatment of COVID. And I was reminded of why we should only be using these therapies in the context of clinical trials in the headlines just this week. Every medication um, can have adverse events and our critically ill patients already have a low reserve to absorb additional stressors. So um, final slide, for, for more in-depth information on the topics that we discussed, please visit the ATS page on COVID related resources where you can find a recording of last week's session. The link will be posted in the chat. And thank you again for joining us this week and I'll hand the microphone back to Dr. Karadi Alexander. Great.
Thank you so much, Dr. Cipro. I uh, appreciated that synopsis. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, yeah, feel free to place them in the chat. Um, with that, we're going to move on to uh, Dr. Hussein, who is going to cover some of the questions and controversies in COVID care. Uh, I'm sure he's going to enlighten us as to what we should be doing now for these patients. All right. Uh, can you see the slides okay? Yes. Hi, everyone. This is Abdur here at UCSD. So we'll, we'll start off with a quick question. So we have a 46-year-old male. Uh, he has ARDS from COVID on mechanical ventilation, and he has the following lab abnormalities. It's a long question, but in general, pretty sick on lung protective ventilation, uh, ARDS on 100% of fire to high P. Um, are we able to ask the questions? Yes. All right. So ready? Yep. All right. So our first question is, uh, which of the following would you consider at this time for this critically ill patient with COVID? Uh, so you can choose corticosteroids, hydro hydroxychloroquine, tocilizumab, remdesivir, or convalescent plasma. So we'll give you uh, 15 seconds to go ahead and click through uh, if you would choose uh, any of those to treat with. Awesome, we've gotten 75 people voting so far, so we have some uh, choices neck and neck. All right, so the winner right, there, right now is remdesivir with 29% of people voting for it. Uh, Tocilizumab is close behind at 22% and corticosteroids coming up third at 20%. Uh, the loser of the group is convalescent plasma at 12%. <laughs> okay, all right, so um, great. That's, that's exactly what we wanted to sort of talk about. So one other question before we, we move forward. All right, question number two, which of the following anticoagulation strategies would you opt for? So your choices are therapeutic systemic low-dose heparin, prophylactic dose enoxaparin, therapeutic dose enoxaparin, therapeutic direct oral anticoagulant, or prophylactic direct an oral anticoagulant. And again, we'll give you uh, 15 seconds to go ahead and click through on uh, whether you would use any of those anticoagulants. For this critically ill COVID patient. Great, we already have uh, 100 people who have voted. Uh, we have prophylactic dose enoxaparin leading the gang uh, at 49%, um, followed by therapeutic systemic low dose heparin at 26%, and therapeutic dose enoxaparin at 21%. Um, both of the direct oral anticoagulants got two to four percent. All right, great. So this is great. Um, well, here's a list of questions that you know constantly came up when we were caring for these patients in our ICU a few weeks ago. So keep in mind, this is a constantly evolving situation, and things are changing rapidly. It highlights how much we don't know currently due to lack of good evidence. I'll be talking about a few of these treatment options listed here. Um, so let's start quickly with hydroxychloroquine, the most popular one. Uh, it interferes with entry of the virus and even post-entry stages of the virus and replication, but is also an immune modulator. Uh, that's why it's used in a lot of autoimmune diseases. So far, the availability is limited, but it is currently being used throughout the nation as a treatment for COVID-19. Um, here's a... Clinical trials are ongoing. There are many trials going on on hydroxychloroquine. This non-randomized clinical trial showed that hydroxychloroquine reduced the viral load, and it worked even better, they said, when combined with azithromycin. But again, this was a small single-center study with 26 patients, of which six dropped out, and it had many other limitations. So we also don't know the significance of viral load uh, clearance from nasopharyngeal swabs, as we know that some of these patients clear there, but they continue to have low respiratory tract infections. 
So for now, at this time, we say there's insufficient data to determine efficacy. Um, Alex mentioned that news that there was a trial that was stopped. I think that was in Brazil due to concerns for maybe uh, cardiac events. You know, ongoing clinical trials will give us a better answer. You know, it is being used off-label, but we are seeing shortage of this drug, particularly for patients who have a true indication like malaria and autoimmune diseases, which can have serious consequences, as you can imagine. Um, and as far as azithromycin, I, th I think it still has a role if you suspect superimposed bacterial infection. Now, the next drug, um, which has really been studied in Ebola, uh, is remdesivir. Gilead had a compassionate use program, which actually stopped around March 27th uh, because of the increase in demand. They are transitioning right now to expanded access program, but at this time, clinical trials are the best way to get this drug and are the best way to administer this drug to your patients. There was this recent study that came out last week um, from data that was collected on patients that got remdesivir on under compassionate use. Uh, it looked promising, but again, it's a small, non-randomized study with many limitations, um, and uh, some patients were lost to follow up as well. So in short, when it, when it, remdesivir efficacy remains unknown and there are clinical trials that are ongoing. So you try and get, and get your patients enrolled in these trials if they're available at your institute. Finally, a quick word on Calitra. Um, this is the only uh, drug that has been studied in a well-controlled randomized trial, um, but unfortunately it was a negative study, which showed no significant reduction in mortality at 28 days. Um, earlier this month, ATS came out with interim guidance, and hydroxychloroquine, as you can see, was suggested under, under certain circumstances, um, although there were no suggestions for many of the other drugs, you can see uh, what the task force was favoring towards by looking at these percentages. IDSA just came out with their guidelines, and they, in summary, their guidelines review the current literature on existing um, lit, uh, data that's there, but they basically recommend uh, all these drugs should be used only in the context of a clinical trial. I won't talk about steroids in ARDS. It's a, it's a whole separate talk, um, but IDS, IDSA recommends against steroids in patients who do not have uh, ARDS. So finally, a word about uh, anticoagulation. We know that in general, patients with ARDS and sepsis have a higher risk for having VTE. Uh, based on some data coming from China, there was a suggestion that maybe patients with COVID-19 are at a higher risk. This study also recently published uh, was a retrospective study, and it showed no difference in mortality in all patients. A subgroup with high SIC score or D-dimer had a difference in mortality, but there were many limitations to this study. What's worth noting is that the dose used in this study is what we use here in US for prophylaxis. So by looking at this study, it means 78% of the patients were not even on prophylactic anticoagulation, which sounds surprising. And I found this to be the best recommendation at this time. Um, and it says use prophylactic dose in oxyparin for all patients admitted to the hospital unless there is any contraindication. And systemic anticoagulation should be reserved if there is high suspicion or diagnosed VTE if you have a patient who has a pulmonary embolism or other indication. There, currently, there is no data to support benefit for any D-dimer cutoffs, for instance. Um, we had a case in our ICU where we were considering systemic anticoagulation. Someone who had a sudden increase in death space, hypoxemia, worsening all of a sudden, and we were concerned that this patient might have PE. Like a lot of our patients, it's hard for them to go down and get a scan. And we were thinking about starting systemic anticoagulation. RV was, the right ventricle was seemed like it was struggling. But that patient also had a neurostatus change, so we had to rule out a stroke first. 
uh, as you know, which is another concern in some of these COVID-19 patients having some CNS uh, symptoms or manifestations. So in short, we need to be paying attention and making sure that we're not causing any harm. At the same time, we need to stay patient and practice evidence-based medicine. That's all I have for the topics that I want to go over. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, that was terrific. I think we hit the highlights of how we just need more information, more data, and we all wish that we had medications that already helped us in treating this uh, difficult uh, patient population. Um, after last week's forum, we got lots of feedback that the attendees really liked um, the case presentation and wanted more COVID cases to work through. Um, there was also feedback that people really want um, some more basic uh, training on how to manage a mechanical ventilator, me eh, mechanical ventilators. Um, so we have Dr. Uh, Rolfson with us today who is going to share a brief COVID case that's going to lead directly into Dr. Bellinghouse and Stewart uh, taking us through what are the initial mechanical ventilator settings to reach for and how to manage that vent as your patient changes uh, over time. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Dr. Rolfson. Great. Thanks, Dr. Carl Alexander. So I'm Mark. I'm one of the UCSD residents, uh, and we'll be talking today about ventilators, uh, for people who don't like them. It will be led by Dr. Amy Bellinghausen, one of our pulmonary critical care fellows. No interest from either one of us, conflicts of interest. Um, so we're going to start off with a very quick case to springboard from, and then we're just going to go over some uh, basic ventilator modes and settings, as well as some high points on troubleshooting. So first we'll talk about uh, one of our COVID ICU patients. Um, he's a 32-year-old male um, who was uh, otherwise healthy, had a history of hypertension, but he had multiple days of dyspnea at first on exertion and then eventually with rest. Um, so he came into the ER. He was satting 86% on room air. He was placed on four liters nasal cannula and was noted to have a fever of 102.4. A couple hours later, his O2 requirements increased to 12 liters salt or nasal cannula. He was tachypnic to a respiratory rate of 28, and uh, we decided to intubate him. So he's a guy with, um, he's 5'11", has a BMI about 28, and weighs 90 kilos. Um, his chest, chest x-ray is seen there on the left. And so with all this information, um, I'll ask uh, everyone listening to kind of think about how they would approach the ventilator settings, uh, and then Dr. Bellinghausen can um, give us her approach to uh, the initial settings. Again, be thinking what mode would you start in, volume control, pressure control, pressure support, SIMV, all those things. And we have things. some options, yeah, so here are some options. Uh, and there might be more than one right answer, but think about which ones would seem reasonable to you and which one you would have to choose if you, um, if this was a test, and, and then we'll go from there. So thank you, Mark, for uh, that lead-in. This is Amy. Um, yeah, so just wanted to talk a little bit, like I said, about uh, ventilator strategies for folks who didn't necessarily think that they would be managing a ventilator. Um, so if this looks a little bit overwhelming to you, that's okay, that's expected. So some of your choices here, volume control plus, uh, with a rate of 12, 505, and 100%, uh, volume control, pressure control, APRV, and then my favorite option is ask someone else. So Laura, do we have voting already going on here? Uh, we decided not, not to go with the official one. Uh, okay. just people can type into the chat box. Uh, so we got a vote for B. All right, so these were, these were my choices if I had to pick, and I'm going to go over a little bit of details of why I would recommend um, these kinds of settings in this case. So, but ask someone else, like I said, is always an acceptable choice. So when you are looking at um, what you should set for a mechanical ventilator, one of the first things to do is pick a mode. 
So there are lots and lots of choices. You'll hear about APRV, you'll hear about pressure support, but really I'd like to narrow your choices for you a bit and recommend volume control, maybe pressure control, or maybe a hybrid mode. So volume control is probably the one that we have the best data for in ARDS. Uh, that's where most of the studies have been conducted. Really other modes like APRV, SIMV, those are more for salvage therapy or weaning therapy. So um, volume control and pressure control are going to be your friends here. Um, hybrid modes like VTPC, VC+, and PRVC are all different versions of the same thing. And you, as the provider, set them like a volume control mode, but they're actually, underneath it all, a pressure control mode. So in ARDS, I would say the first thing to reach for is volume control. Uh, a little bit of that will depend on your institution, but I think getting comfortable with that is a good start. All right, so next thing, set your parameters. Respiratory rate. Uh, big mistake that I see interns often making, and I certainly made myself a few times, is to not take into account what the person was breathing before you put them on the ventilator. So if somebody is breathing 28 times a minute and you put them on a respiratory rate of 12, you're going to be in trouble. So consider your pre-intubation minute ventilation before you set your respiratory rate. Generally, avoid a respiratory rate greater than 35. Um, that number may be lower depending on your patient, but when you get to rates higher than 35, you start to have a lot of problems with air trapping where the patient isn't completely exhaling before you're done and auto peeping. For tidal volume, I think everybody listening has heard the number six mg per kg. Um, this is was one of the major changes in ventilatory strategies, but using low tidal volume ventilation, or again, six mg per kg of predicted body weight is one of the biggest things that we can do to reduce mortality on the ventilator. Um, six mg per kg is calculated based on predicted body weight, which is based on height, not on our actual weight. A tool, Malhotra, has a great point that if you went out and gained 100 pounds, you would not grow any new lung. So uh, just remember to calculate it based on height. Um, there are some great cal calculators online. Um, keep, how much keep should you use? The real answer is enough. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about this later, but keep is an important part of your setting. And FiO2, generally you're setting it at 100% and then titrating down from there. The goal PaO2 is probably greater than 60. I think Judd Lansford, last week made, uh, gave a good explanation of why that's a good target. Some other goals that you'll see or ventilator strategies that you'll see will recommend 55 and above, but personally I tend to shoot for 60, 65 and above. Some advanced settings, uh, IE ratio, trigger, waveform, feel free to ask your local pulmonologist or RT anytime you're bored and want to listen for an hour. All right, so continued with settings. Step three, evaluate the response. And this is my first tip for folks who are new to ventilators is don't just set and forget the ventilator, but evaluate the response. So you want to do that by looking at four different things. One, look at the patient. Are they coughing? Are they breathing irregularly? Are they fighting the vent? Two, look at the vent. Are the peak pressures high? Are the plateau pressures high? And we'll get to how to use those numbers in a minute. Two, look at the monitor. So in this case, the patient's monitor is showing that you're not doing a very good job of oxygenating them. Um, you need to look and make sure they're oxygenating well. Setting a high PEEP can drop your blood pressure, so that's something to be aware of. High heart rates may be a sign of poor sedation. And end tidal changes can be an early warning that you've got some changes uh, in how you're actually ventilating the patient. Uh, and then fourth, look at the blood gas. So pH, PCO2, and PO2. All right, so continuing on with the case. Whoever was setting the ventilator didn't listen to me and decided to set the vent on a volume control with a rate of 22, a tidal volume of 425, a PEEP of 5, and an FiO2 of 50%. So, you know, you've got an okay respiratory rate. Tidal volume looks good. We're at that 6 mg per kilo mark. PEEP is maybe a little low and didn't start with 100%. 
Blood gas in 30 minutes is 720, uh, CO2 of 54, and a PaO2 of 52. <laughs> Laura, you're making a face. I made that face too. <laughs> so what now? Uh, it's always a bad sign when your PCO2 is higher than your PaO2. Um, so your options are, and again, more than one answer may be right. One, increase the respiratory rate. Two, increase the tidal volume. Three, increase the peak. Four, increase the FO2. Or five, panic. Um, I'm sure panic, you can panic, panic. the wrong answer. <laughs> um, but I'll give you a second to think about that. Any uh, feedback from the chat here? Yeah, we have a bunch of C's and D's. We have a C, okay. we have an ACD. We have C and D, C and D, and then panic. Uh, all of the above. <laughs> we need more data. ACD, ACD. All right. So we got all over the board, which is great, because to be honest with you, any and all of these can be right, other than, again, panic. Um, I probably wouldn't go first to increase the tidal volume, but increasing the respiratory rate is going to be a big one. Oh, I see I'm getting annotated. Um, we may increase the PEEP and we may increase the FIO2, but the first thing is we need to actually find out more information about the patient. So you talk to the respiratory therapist, you find out that the patient is still looking paralyzed, there are no alarms going off, and their actual respiratory rate is the same as their set respiratory rate. And so that helps you decide what to do next. So talking about the oxygenation first, this patient's oxygenation is no good. Uh, their PaO2 is in the 50s, so you need to do something fast, FiO2. So turn up that FiO2 to 100%, give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. Slower impact is going to be from the peak. And I, people ask me all the time when I'm trying to teach about ventilators, um, how do I know how much peak I should put someone on? So this is the wonderful piece of wisdom that we have been handed from the ARDSNET folks. And what I do is I titrate the FiO2 to get them to a reasonable stat above 94. And then I look to see how much FiO2 did I need. So in this patient, I might turn them up to 100 and then see if I could turn it down to 0 0.9, 0 0.8. And then based on that, I would set the PEEP. There are two ladders, a high PEEP ladder and a low PEEP ladder. Doesn't matter which one you choose, we think. All right. So regarding the ventilation, uh, this patient's CO2 is also too high. So if PEEP and FiO2 are the things that impact oxygenation, respiratory rate and tidal volume are the things that impact ventilation. So going up on the respiratory rate inc or increasing the tidal volume can help in this case. This again is from that uh, ARDSNET protocol card, which I have a link to here. Um, from our low tidal volume register or from our low tidal volume studies, uh, we have this great protocol and it tells you what to do in the case of mild acidemia, uh, which is to increase the ventilator rate up to a maximum of 35 uh, to get your pH greater than 7.3. So in this case, like I said, I would probably increase the respiratory rate, increase the PEEP, and increase the FiO2. All right. So you set the vet to the following. You've increased the rate by four, the tidal volume's the same, you've increased the PEEP to 12, and FiO2 is, you're able to settle it out at about 70%, and your repeat blood gas is 732, 46, 73, your SAT on the monitor is 95. Success. All right, so an hour later, you called the bedside because the patient is desaturating. Looking through the door, you see he's satting about 83%. What next? So. Do you increase PEEP, increase the FiO2, change to a prone position, or get more information? And of course, all of you have taken tests, so you know it's gonna be D. <laughs> but um, all of these may, again, be correct answers, but definitely you wanna get more information in this case. Step one, though, put on your PPE uh, with the disclaimer that PPE may vary uh, between hospitals but uh, make sure that you're protecting yourself. There's no emergency in a pandemic. Uh, if you're running in there without PPE on, you're putting everybody at risk. All right, so you get your PPE on, you go into the room, and you see that the patient's peak pressure alarm is going off. So I talked about this a little earlier, that um, this is one of the numbers you wanna look for on the ventilator to see if things are going wrong. Is the peak pressure high? 
So let's see. Can you all see my mouse? Okay. Um, so here is just a waveform of pressure over time for a patient who's on volume control ventilation. This is one of the other reasons I like it for ARDS. And you can see that the highest pressure they get to is the peak pressure. But then if you do something called an inspiratory hold, so have them hold their breath on the ventilator basically, which you do with the button, um, you can check the plateau pressure. When just the peak pressure is high, but the plateau pressure is significantly lower by five millimeters of mercury or more, this is tip number three, this tends to be an airway or tubing problem. So this can really help you troubleshoot where the problem is. Um, it can be either the patient has a big mucus plug, they're biting on their tube, they have a clot in their airways, or sometimes bronchospasm. But this is a clue. You see the peak pressure alarm going off. You can take a look at that difference between the peak pressure and the plateau pressure to really get a sense of where your problem is in the airway. In contrast, this is what it might look like. Now your peak pressure alarm will still go off because your peak pressure will be high, but there's a small difference between the peak pressure and the plateau pressure indicating that your problem is actually lung compliance, pleural space problem, or chest wall problem. Um, it could also be a pneumothorax. So um, this is just a quick bit of information on basic ventilator settings. Um, adjusting based on a blood gas, and then troubleshooting when you have high peak pressure alarms, what the different plateau pressures are. I think a tool next week is going to talk a little bit more about trouble, troubleshooting ventilator asynchrony. So again, three tips, how not to kill people with ventilators. Don't just set and forget the vent. Make vent changes based on the whole patient. Look at them. Um, and then a high peak but normal plateau is an airway or tubing problem, whereas a high peak and high plateau is an alveolar, pleural, or chest wall problem. So thank you, Laura, for facilitating and inviting me to present. Um, and I did borrow some slides and info from Mark Bukowski and Atul Mahotra. Great. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> Thanks everybody for hanging in there. We have uh, 173 people on the line and we've sort of hovered in that range uh, for the entire time. Um, that was our first half of the forum. We're covering some of the uh, clinical aspects of COVID. I'm pleased to welcome two special visitors to this forum. Um, both of them are from hard hit areas. So Dr. Christine Bojanowski uh, is an assistant professor of medicine at Tulane, and she also uh, attends at the VA in New Orleans. And we also have Dr. Uh, Jeff Silverstein on the line uh, from Southside Hospital in New York. Uh, so I want to just say up front, thank you both uh, for joining. Uh, we're happy to have you here to share your experiences on um, your clinical expertise with these patients, patients, the challenges that you're facing, uh, and some of the workflow uh, problems that you've had. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing this screen here and make sure we have unmuted our two guests. All right, I'm All right. ready. Yes. We have one. <laughs> Yes. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so we were going to run this as sort of an open discussion. Uh, I'd love to hear about your guys' experiences. I know everybody on the line would be too. Um, I'm going to ask people who are on the line to submit their questions in the chat. Uh, they can post them directly to me, Laura Crotty Alexander, if they don't want to publicly post their questions. <laughs> Otherwise, they can post them to everyone. Um, so just to start with, uh, so Dr. Bojanowski, uh, if you want to dive in about what it's been like in New Orleans with this crazy surge. Oh. Sorry, you got muted again. Oh, uh, no. Oh, oh there we go. okay, there I'm back on. Um, before I started, I, uh, you know, and just said a little bit about what's going on down here is um, I just really wanted to applaud you and applaud um, all the speakers today. This is a really great forum. Um, and I am so impressed by um, the short presentations um, with the clarity and the thoroughness um, of those. I think um, 
constant conversation and discussion and updating of each other is so important, especially if you're in an area that's revving up, um, you know, we're seeing a rise in cases. Um, and I think also when you are in a hard hit hospital system, like we are here in all of our hospital systems, um, I think one of the other most important things is just recognizing each other and our efforts. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think uh, burnout is really real. Um, I think anxiety levels are high. Um, people are really scared um, and still coming and showing up to work. So I really just want to give a round of applause to everyone here, everyone that's um, participating and being proactive in discussions. Um, I think it's extremely important for not only our patients, but for ourselves. So um, really great job, everyone. Really like those talks. Um, I, you know, so I'm happy to be here and ask any, um, answer any questions. Um, I can tell you just a little brief overview of, of our condition and our stay here in New Orleans. Um, you know, we started revving up um, uh, within the past, really within the past month. Um, the Louisiana Department of Health does a great job with posting every day and updating numbers um, and working on communicating um, with healthcare providers on the total number of cases that we have in the state. Um, I gave a grand round um, a couple weeks ago on critical care and during the time of COVID. And at that time, and that was two weeks ago, we had 5,000 cases in the state, um, 1,300 in the hospital, um, a little bit over 400 on ventilators. The majority of cases of those are, are in New Orleans. Um, and as of today, we have about almost reaching 20,000 cases in the state. Um, we've had 755 deaths. We, uh, the one thing though, despite those scary numbers, is that what we have seen at least here, and it's really too early to call this for sure, but social distancing really works. Um, we've seen a plateau in our cases recently, um, which has been really, um, uh, really uplifting for, to everyone here. Um, and it's made it so that we can get through this. Um, so as I was saying just a couple weeks ago, we had like 13, 1400 people in the hospital um, you know, as of today, we have about 2,000, so not so much more. And the patients on ventilators, um, we had uh, like 438 at that time, and we have about 436 now. Um, so, you know, the hospitals have been strained definitely, but we've not, um, you know, and we've had times when we've been uh, saturated or very near saturated. Um, we've never, uh, unfortunately, we've not had the issues with ventilators. We've had a good amount of support from the state in terms of setting up kind of um, essentially like step down areas with our convention center here that is um, low acuity people that are still just not able to go to LTACs or nursing homes um, because those are not, uh, those are generally not um, accepting patients that have tested positive for COVID. Um, so that's kind of the overall thing I, I do uh, attend at, um, at three different hospitals here. The big ones are University Hospital and Tulane. Um, anything I'm going to share with you guys today is also going to be this on that statement alone is really going to be anecdotal and my personal kind of experience is not reflecting. I'm not making a statement for uh, the university or for University Hospital. Um, but uh, yeah, that's kind of like my, my upfront disclaimers. Um, there's definitely been, um, I think for me, and I won't go too much into this, but you know, some of the biggest things, um, you know, is how to address, uh, you know, teaching rounds during this time. Um, PPE, huge. Um, the, and then just addressing the amount of contact we have with patients on a day-to-day -day basis, how we streamline um, and minimize um, putting healthcare workers at further risk for high exposure. Um, the differences we've had with running codes um, and really with end of life as well. So those are all things I think have been um, most impactful to me. I think um, as Abdur went over, there were there are some um, trials that are out. There's a lot of controversy about treatments. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we face in the unit um, related to COVID um, are things that we know how to treat. You know, we know how to treat ARDS. There is great evidence behind treatment strategies for that, you know. Um, and uh, renal failure, you know, there are a lot of the things that we that we do run into um, are things that we know how to treat. I think the rest of the treatments, uh, you know, again, are going to be just controversial um, until we get more data, right? 
Um, I don't want to hog up the time. I just kind of went off on my soapbox, but I want to turn this over to Jeff and make sure I'm not hogging up too much. But I'm happy to answer anything um, and engage in any discussion. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think what I heard as takeaways is that, you know, it, there are high levels of burnout across healthcare workers, probably across the entire community because everybody is in this panic. Uh, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, uh, and that we should really pull together as a community and really help each other as much as possible. Um, I did launch a couple of polls just to get a bit of audience engagement. And um, from the audience um, in their regions, most of them said that COVID is just ramping up now or they're reaching their peak. I know here in San Diego, we're already downtrending. Uh, we just didn't experience a crazy surge uh, like you have. And then in terms of availability of PPE at their hospitals, um, sort of middle of the road, 35% said the availability was fine. Uh, about 24% availability of PPE was uh, poor. Uh, and then only 5% said very poor. So at this point, I love uh, Jeff, if, uh, Dr. Zilberstein, if you would dive in, uh, give a bit of the New York City perspective. Um, we do have a couple of specific questions coming through the chat, like use of non-invasive ventilation, what's the hardest thing to deal with uh, with COVID patients, um, but we can circle back to those too. Sure. So um, uh, we kind of got hit first. I'm 30 miles east of New York City in Long Island. Um, uh, and it's been it's 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 been really a, uh, an education. We uh, have a 36 bed ICU. Uh, we're taking care of 130 ICU patients uh, in five different non ICU areas um, with more ventilators than I care to count, but 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 three figure ventilation. So uh, 110, 120 ventilators. Um, that's kind of involved a lot of different sort of. Uh, operational struggles that I'm not sure would be relevant necessarily to the listeners here. I want to just also echo um, how impressive the initial discussions were. So I just kind of, I, I, I think it's great to have these sorts of forums. So I'm happy to talk about the operational struggles if that's going to be the question, but I, but, but I suspect it's going to be more kind of clinical. Uh, from a clinical scenario, what I can say is that uh, uh, lung compliance has not been as much of an issue. We, we found that self-proning has been a huge help for floor patients. So oftentimes we're getting consulted and we're just telling them to have some belly time like toddlers have or my one-year-old and two-year-old when they were back in the day. Uh, some tummy time, two hours twice a day. Um, uh, we uh, um, initially tried diuresis as well uh, to, to try to save some ICU admissions. Um, uh, we, we could get into BiPAP and, and various strategies later on. We've seen a lot of renal failure and um, far more than we were expecting. And that's actually the biggest bugaboo now. Um, ventilators I, I kept me up at night for the first few weeks. And now it's lack of hemodialysis that's keeping me up. And it's not just the machines. It's actually the nurses and it's all the setups and everything else. And so trying to figure out you know, how to adjudicate who gets dialysis, who gets CRRT, um, who has a chance. Um, that's kind of been a big struggle for us. VTE is a big struggle as well. We're seeing a lot of patients who are having VTE. We are not doing uh, anticoagulation prophylactically in terms of full dose anticoagulation, but we have doubled up on the enoxaparin based on just our experience. There's no, there's no good trial evidence, but uh, we're using enoxaparin 40 twice a day for normal renal failure, no, non-renal failure patients. Um, uh, other things uh, to think about in terms of uh, uh, care for these patients, we have, we've kind of run out of, of uh, um, Nimbex, and so we've had to kind of use pushes of paralytics. Yeah. Uh, propofol infusion syndrome has been a huge problem, uh, much more than what I've seen before. Uh, um, we, we've had just crap loads of midazolam infusions, which is kind of kicking it old school. Um, uh, but our ICU nurses are four to five to one rather than two to one. We're outside of ICUs. So we, we've had to keep people safe. And also with our high PEEP strategy, uh, it's terribly uncomfortable to be on a tidal volume of 380 and a PEEP of 18. So, um, and when you're 45 and 50 years old, uh, you tend to need more sedative and, and anxiolytic. So 
we've seen a lot of a, a lot of midazolam and fentanyl uh, infusions that are that have been required, and as a result of that, then as they're getting better, some encephalopathy, probably some delirium, and we've also seen some encephalitis, some COVID encephalitis. Some, uh, so a lot of these things clinically that have been problematic that. Uh, some of which we were ready for in terms of the Chinese data. And I think that we were surprised by the renal failure and the encephalopathy business uh, and the VTE for that matter. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think for, for, for our end, I think VTE was one of the, one of the big things we were catching on up front. Um, and and I, I totally echo. Um, we are used to having to be a little bit more creative or be more creative, as you were saying, doing pushes with the paralytics, using more burst head, dealing with more encephalopathy afterwards, and just the slow wake up and the and delirium. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know one thing that came up last week, and I feel like you two probably have had a lot of experience with this, but there's a lot of worry about running end of life discussions when families aren't allowed uh, in the hospital. And so I'd love you to speak about your experiences and any advice you have. Ladies first. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think this is just one of, you know, um, one of the things I love about critical care is that even, you know, you can switch and, and do wonderful palliative and end-of-life care. Um, and it is definitely a challenge here. Um, you know, one thing I found to be very effective in our hospital is that the palliative care team and the psychiatry services have really um, taken a uh, taken a really big role in this in helping the teams that are really overwhelmed with just um, you know uh, just the day to day uh, just the day to day running in the ICU. Um, so they have been uh, you know one great strategy has been having one of the psychiatry residents or palliative care um, team members kind of auto consult and follow along with us, and they call every day and we call when we can. Um, it is extremely hard to talk to a, a family member um, and, you know, and then have them ask, well, when can I come in and see my mother? When can I come in and see my loved one? You say, well, unfortunately, based on our policy, you know, we, you can't um, unless it is we are passionately uh, or compassionate, uh, doing a compassionate extubation. And at that point, you come in and it's arranged through the hospital with security, 10 minutes limited in full PPE. Um, it's extremely difficult. Um, some of the things that have been very helpful have been using things like um, FaceTime, iPads, trying to, um, you know, give a little bit really for the family to be able to see their loved one, um, you know, be able to say something through that, that, um, that media. Um, but yeah, I think that's one of the biggest, the biggest challenges. Um, it's, uh, it can be really traumatic for the families and, and for, the, for the healthcare workers. So the other thing that I would kind of add to that, I think that's a great summary, but we're also having non-intensivist care for these patients. Mm -hmm. um, and the non-intensivists are less familiar with kind of these sorts of discussions generally. Um, uh, and so uh, this has been a real challenge to try to get, uh, the, and, and our pal we don't have residents and that sort of thing. And so um, when you have a, a hospital that's a little bit more stretched, it becomes far more problematic to try to adjudicate these resources and try to say, you know, if you, if you have three palliative medicine physicians and you have 130 ICU patients and you have cardiologists managing over here and cardiothoracic surgeons managing over here and general surgeons managing over here, it becomes a real challenge. Um, uh, so I think that one of the things that uh, is, I think, of, of great benefit in, in these sorts of conversations is to um, talk to the families and really just, I, I mean, you know, when, when I was having these conversations with families, I would just, I, I, I would cry with them. I mean, this is, it's devastating. And I would, and I would share how devastating it is. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, a tra it's a tragedy, not just for the patient, but for the family and for the community that that they have to die alone and so i share with them that they're not they're not there alone i mean that we are there with them and we're spending time with them and we're holding their hand and and uh that's very very meaningful so um one of the things that we did early on is uh um kind of from an operational perspective is every patient every day gets a phone call from a team member 
uh, and, and, and I was able to then make sure that that was documented in the chart and then this is the person that we called at this time because then we were able to at least follow up on that. And so that's really, really important is that a member of the medical team, sometimes we have to kind of then assign a PA or assign somebody else uh, to, to, to make that phone call because we're too busy, but somebody has to do that um, uh, even if there's no change at all just because these families – are quarantined at home as well, and they're literally waiting by the phone for that yeah, for that call. So, um, I, I don't think I have anything else smart to say. This is just a really challenging time. One of the things that I would add to to that is that, and it's a little bit different for us at the University of Maryland than it is for you, Jeff, um, because we have we're not overwhelmed with just all COVID patients. We also have some other patients that are non-COVID patients, but also who can't get visitors. Um, and our and so I've asked our house staff teams that are less busy taking care of non-COVID patients to all spend at least five to 10 minutes in, in a patient's room talking about something non-medical, um, asking them about their job or where they came from or you know how, what, what their life is like and what they're looking forward to when they get out because that humanity is missing right now in, in, our, in our hospital. And, um, and I think it's really, really important that we remember that as we take care of the patients in our community. It's a great point. There's some questions, I guess, about a respiratory therapist. Do you guys feel like, kind of, in addition to the support staff, that that you know there there's limits on you as individuals? But how about the other people that have to take care of the patients? So respiratory therapists have been a, a tremendous struggle. I mean, uh, so we have an EICU system, uh, Narav, as I think you know, but uh, that's been that's been stretched because number one. We're taking care of a tremendous number of patients outside our hardwired ICU. Number two is that even if, if, if they can kind of do an EMR review for us, plateau pressures aren't being measured or they're not being documented in the computer. So what we're doing is we're using paper. So it's kind of back to the future. There's no time for the respiratory therapists who are now taking care of 20 patients or so at a time potentially to be documenting all of these things in the, in, the, in the EMR. So there are... Um, uh, it's back to the future. I mean, you know, we're using paper outside the room because now there's no HIPAA problem because nobody's coming into the hospital anymore. We're posting the papers where uh, this is, these are the vent settings, this is the plateau pressure, hopefully they're measuring it. And then we're gonna have a little post-it note with these are the orders for the change and this is the, when we want the ABG. And so that's kind of, uh, that's been our strategy. I mean, the respiratory therapists have been uh, really challenged in this time. Dr. Bernstein and Dr. Bajnowski, uh, there is a question uh, about how did you manage delirium in the critically ill patients in the hot spots? Because you know you can't have sitters in the rooms, and so how did you guys deal with that? So I'll I'll answer I, um, with a lot of difficulty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with a lot of difficulty. I mean, so ultimately what we're seeing is a lot of hypoactive delirium rather than hyperactive delirium because they've had days and days and days of benzodiazepines. It's literally back to the future. It's the way that ICUs were run 20 years ago. Um, uh, and, so, and so I've never seen this before really to this extent. Um, uh, and then waking them up is a challenge and then they're waking up and now they're starting to pull at things. One of the strategies that we've been trying to use is, is uh, oral antipsychotics or through the OG or NG tube to try to wean some of these things off along with dexmedetomidine and then, uh, you know, doing the best we can to try to reorient. But, you know, you're going in there kind of, you know, with PPE and masks and, you know, they don't know what time it is, what day it is, then you look like an alien. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not the ideal scenario. I mean, you know, we went from ABCDEF, uh, walking pa patients on the ventilator, and I saw Wes Ely's uh, um, uh, article in, I, I think, the Washington Post, and I was thinking, that would be great. I mean, we were walking patients a few months ago on ventilators, and now they're tied down on midazolam drips for two weeks, and there's not a lot that we can do. I mean, there really isn't. We can't wake patients up every day because we don't have the staff for it. It's not safe. Uh, um, nurses are, are too 
spread thin. Respiratory therapists are too spread thin. So we have to do it in a systematic approach, which is unfortunately not the ABCDEF uh, protocol, which is what we know and love. Absolutely. I think one of the big things that we, uh, you know, this kind of extends beyond that, but again, a lot of that direct bedside from RTs, from the nursing, from the house staff, from, from the attendings, from everyone is really, um, you know, we've really had to try to figure out a way to streamline, you know, most of us are having to either, we have our one PPE for the day and cleaning it down and everything like that in between. And so that presents its own challenges, of course. But I mean, we are really trying to limit um, going to the room, even doing like some of the RT uh, maneuvers. It's like, hey, when you go in there, I'm going to yell at you through this glass and tell you what to do. Um, you know, that actually just, and I'm completely offshooting to the left, but even something that I've, I've noticed particularly recently is I've been having to, um, which is not the ideal situation either, but having to exchange ET tubes. There's a lot of thick mucus yeah. plugging. And, you know, it's because I think, you know, the RTs are so stretched. You know, I'm just wondering if there, things are just sitting, you know, people are not getting suctioned out as much. So we're actually needing to exchange ET tubes, you know, with, I don't want to say so much frequency, but I mean, I had to do. And then they end up de-recruiting, right? And then you, you're, you're two days more on the vent. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big balancing of what you're able to really do and just realizing that um, we will fall short of what we want to do. Yeah. you know, absolutely on, on all of these fronts. Um, yeah. Which, which again leads to your first point about moral distress and burnout, right. because I think that all of us get into this for a specific reason to do the best job that we can. And we're still doing the best job that we can, but it's with limited tools at this point. And so it becomes challenging because you say, you know, um, I wish we could do X, Y, and Z. I know that we can in other circumstances, but we can't today. Mm -hmm. We have another specific question about uh, what are you favoring for maintaining oral access after extubation? Are you using Daboff tubes? Or are you going faster to G tubes? Daboff and NG. I mean, uh, so so either large bore or small bore NG. Uh, we're we're not jumping to uh, pegs or anything. As a matter of fact, we still have yet to trach a person. Um, wow. We're trying to figure out the best strategy around this. There are a few patients that we're now looking to perform tracheostomy in. They're, they're more than three weeks intubated and we're, and we're retesting COVID to see whether they're negative to try to make it safer. So we're still kind of developing strategies around even that. Um, uh, there's not a lot of great science about this is the problem. And so um, we're trying to kind of juggle back and forth the idea that we know that greater than three weeks of oral tracheal intubation will, will cause some problems, we also know that persistence in the PCR positivity might cause worse problems with kind of, you know, aerosolization and so forth. And so uh, the balancing act is kind of a, uh, uh, an act that's more than one person and takes a few people in a room to make a decision. Absolutely. And I think with the um, problem that many patients are persistently positive for days to weeks, um, and now that we're seeing patients who become positive again for a second time, um, it's hard as we're all learning about this virus as we go. Um, okay. yeah. um, we did have uh, another question, so maybe this might be a good uh, point to end on uh, and then have you guys to share any other tips that you want to share. But what has been like the one hardest thing for each of you to deal with being a, you know, a critical care physician in a hot spot? Ladies first. <laughs> He's so gentlemanly. I know. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's pleasant. Thank you so much. This has made my night. Um, yeah, again, I really do think it is um, just the um, just the end of life that we have to see um, and, and, and balancing how to do that and maintaining, um, you know, and protecting the families as much as we can and helping them and protecting our our house staff um, and the and the healthcare workers and the nurses at bedside and that's that's the toughest thing I think. I I think for me it's it's the, uh, the, the toughest part has been really more operational trying to run uh, 120 beds and trying to figure out how to standardize care and train people up and then have expectations and the whole thing. The 
actual kind of practice of medicine has been a joy for me, even though it's been really challenging just by virtue of the fact that it's, you know, uh, um, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking and, and, uh, um, it's devastating, but at least you kind of feel like at the end of the shift, you've done something. Whereas, you know, operationally, you kind of feel like at the end of the day, you've not done much. <laughs> it's just more of the same. Well, thank you so much. I do want to let our uh, listeners know that this has been recorded and that uh, we will be posting this uh, tomorrow, along with the recording from last week, which is already posted. Um, so thank you so much to the ATS staff in particular for uh, organizing this, setting this up, doing the editing, helping with the polls, questions. So Dr. Um, Lauren Lynch, uh, Liz Guzman, and Eileen Larson uh, are the drivers from the American Thoracic Society. And then, of course, the whole um, Critical Care Training Forum working group, um, most of whom are online and chatting, answering questions, and then joining, on, joining in as well. And then our internal resident uh, team of physicians who have been involved uh, with the case presentations as uh, synopses. So thank you, Drs. Ashgar, Cypro, Jones, and Rolfson, and our two pulmonary critical care fellows who joined today, uh, Dr. Bellinghausen-Stewart and Dr. Hussein, for teaching us a little bit more of what we need to know. Um, I would really uh, request that everybody uh, take the survey. This lets us know a little bit about who's on, who's attending the forum, and that way we can direct the teaching directly to you. Um, so you can use the QR code to activate that um, or click on the link, uh, and we've posted that multiple times. I know most of us are <clears throat> keep looking for other ways to help, and so that's why I've also shared this uh, UCSD sleep and general health survey as we're trying to figure out how the pandemic stress is affecting people's uh, sleep quality. Um, so with that in mind, I, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we will be live again uh, next week and we will be tackling some of the hard questions that you guys posed in the chat box. Um, so tune in uh, next week for that. And in the, until then, uh, take care of yourselves. Get outside and be in the sun a little bit every day. Uh, we're thinking about you and hope that you continue fighting the good fight uh, and take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Christine.